Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Robert Daly. Robert is director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Wilson Center, and he joins us to discuss what else? The Olympics, big story in China. Robert, welcome. Thank you. So at the time of our recording, we are on the eve of opening ceremonies. And I'm wondering, I'm always interested that you can provide us with the perspective from within the country, because we're always trying to interpret China from the outside looking in. What is this a big deal for the Chinese people? This is a medium deal for the Chinese people. It pales in comparison to their lead up to the 2008 Summer Olympics, which is, of course, China's uh, great coming out party. It was seen that way domestically and internationally. Uh, the whole country had been ginned up to take interest in every single aspect of that Olympics, where China, in fact, took the most gold medals. And China only counts gold. So that means that they won the Olympics from China's point of view. And it was a banner success from China on Chinese terms. This Olympics is going to be very different. China doesn't shine uh, in the Winter Olympics. In 2018, they took only nine medals, uh, one of them, only one of them gold. And there's very little snow in Beijing. All the snow that you see is going to be uh, man-made snow. So Beijing wasn't a natural choice to host this Olympics. But the only other contender was Kazakhstan. Uh, that would have gone uh, extremely poorly this year had it been held there. So the Chinese people are watching it. They will have some interest. But they're very aware that it's taking place during the COVID pandemic at a time when there have been increasing number of Omicron cases, still very, very low in Beijing, the nearby city of Tianjin, in Wuhan itself. So they're going to have a very uh, highly walled off bubble for everybody involved in the Olympics. There will be daily testing. It will be a sort of antiseptic, hermetically sealed event made for cameras with the purpose from China's point of view, should they succeed in getting through a healthy Olympics? It doesn't really matter how many medals China gets because they haven't built up expectations that way. But if they carry it off and everybody is safe, this will then feed into the narrative fed by China's growth, fed by their treatment of COVID so far, that the Chinese system of governance is really the best, that they have given this mm -hmm. Olympics as a gift to the world and therefore hail the Communist Party, hail Xi Jinping. That's its domestic meaning. Speaking of, uh, of gifts, often it's a gift to the host country in terms of potential profit from all of the tourism and the visitors to the country. Obviously, that's not in the cards during a pandemic. Will, will China lose money on this proposition? Uh, China will lose money almost certainly. Uh, it will probably gain glory. I suspect you know that anything could happen at the Olympics, but I suspect that this succeeds on China's terms and that then Xi Jinping uses it. Uh, to try to give himself a smooth glide path into the 20th Party Congress later in the year, at which he'll probably be anointed for a third term and possibly as something like leader for life. So the glory is worth any economic loss. The, the criticism of China that comes along with an event like this, whether it's the human rights record, whether it's the rather draconian uh, anti-pandemic measures, uh, what you've told me over the years and what we've seen displayed by Chinese leadership is a almost, I was going to say impervious to criticism, maybe even defiant in the face of criticism would be another way to describe it. But we did see a loosening of pandemic restrictions in the last 48 hours. What is that all about? Are they listening to the criticism? I think that they are loosening up right before the Olympics for the sake of being seen as loosening up before the Olympics to blunt some of the criticism rather than to really absorb it and change. And of course, it's China's sovereign right to have a zero tolerance policy and to run this however they want. But as you said, there's been a lot of criticism of China. One is the human rights criticism. We saw Mia Farrow leading the charge to call the 2008 Olympics the Genocide Olympics. That was primarily with reference to Tibet. This time it's with reference to Xinjiang. So they've been criticized uh, on the grounds of human rights. Also, as you said, their handling of COVID, this very draconian approach. And part and parcel of that is an ongoing international critique, heightened now because of the Olympics, of China's use of surveillance, the surveillance state, big data, facial recognition, AI. And so they've been Slight, trying to lighten up a little bit over the past few weeks. Uh, they trucked ya, uh, Yao Ming, their great basketball player who participated in the 2008 Olympics out last week, sort of in a half-hearted way. Now they're easing back on the gas a little bit on the draconian aspects of what they're doing. But yesterday, uh, China's foreign minister Wang Yi spoke with Secretary of State 
uh, Anthony Blinken. And if you read the Chinese readouts on this, the State Department makes no mention of it. Uh, Wang Yi sort of read him the riot act and said, you know, stop trying to undermine and criticize the Beijing Olympics, stop insulting China. Uh, so that piece is still there, lightening up on some fronts, hitting back on others. But all of these critiques, human rights, surveillance, COVID, if you just read the American papers, it gives you the sense that the Chinese government is under assault in these Olympics. And that must be the, you know, the narrative for them. And it really isn't. They've got their policies for this. They're confident of the way they're handling it. They would rather be loved. They'd rather not be criticized. They'll punch back. But they're not going to worry about this too much because their primary audience is the Chinese domestic audience. Mm -hmm. And not missing an opportunity, Vladimir Putin publicly supported the Chinese position and accused the U.S. of politicizing the games as well. Uh, you know, does China have anything to prove? I mean, to itself or to the rest of the world? Well, I suspect that, you know, if they could go back in time knowing about COVID and not bid on these Olympics, that they might well <laughs> do that. Uh, I think they would like to do a little bit better than Tokyo. Uh, but what they, what they really want to reprove to themselves and to the world is uh, that the Chinese government is competent and that it's competent, particularly in contrast to that of the United States, and that that competence proves that the one-party dictatorship of the Communist Party is the right way to go, and that it proves uh, that China is right to be reaching for global leadership. It's a narrative of, of, of competence this time, uh, not medals, and that has both a domestic and an international purpose. Uh, as you know, there's been a, a diplomatic boycott, a number of countries, the United States, the UK, uh, Australia, Canada are not sending high level officials, although we're sending consular officials and we're sending uh, obviously the athletes. Uh, Putin uh, will be there, uh, the president of South Korea will be there. So Xi Jinping will have some people with him uh, waving in the stands. And because there are no fans there and because the media is going to be so curtailed, the Chinese people will see what she wants them to see. They'll have the impression that he wants them to have. Zhang Yimou, the great Chinese film director, is staging the opening ceremony this year, as he did in 2008. So the Chinese people will get, I think, a, a wonderful show. And in the, I think, unlikely event that any medal winners from the podium want to criticize what happened in Xinjiang, all of the in-country media transmissions in China are going to be on time delay. So they're on that one. They'll edit it out. The Chinese people will never know. About this, uh, our system is better than your system competition. You mentioned the security issues that have arisen, uh, recommendations to athletes from multiple countries to bring so-called burner phones right. so that their own devices aren't compromised. Uh, the, the mandatory Olympics app that China has created that also has the capacity to edit out certain words in any transmissions. Does this undercut their whole message that we're the way to go, our way is the way to go? In part, yes. In some parts of the world, yes. Uh, but not all over the world and not in some of the areas where China is making its greatest inroads uh, by leveraging its wealth uh, to build you know, respect or deference or influence. South America, Africa, Central Asia, uh, Southeast Asia. Not every part of the world is equally concerned about things like intrusive apps. And as I say, if they can get through this without a COVID outbreak and have a more or less safe Olympics, uh, then they probably just move right past it because all of the negative China narratives that have been exacerbated somewhat by the Olympics were already dialed up to 11. You know, this just brings them to 11.1. And then they settle back down to 11 again. Uh, and so I think that it's probably all going to be water off a duck's back uh, if they get through it without a major uh, political event or a major... COVID outbreak, and they'll just proceed with their plan to the 20th Party Congress, and they'll declare uh, the Olympics a great success. Yes, um, athletes are being told to bring burner phones. They should bring them anyway. You know, we, we do this uh, at the Wilson Center. Corporations do it. They, they bring For international travel, travel in general, travel not just computers, to uh, travel phones. And so this is maybe letting a few people know about Chinese surveillance who didn't know about it. But that narrative mm -hmm. is already several years old. So I don't think it really blackens their eye. So, so uh, is there any discussion in Chinese media or within the Chinese power structure about their Olympics being somewhat upstaged by what's happening on the Russian-Ukrainian border? Uh, no, very, very little. Uh, the Chinese media these days, the People's Daily, 
uh, the, the Global Times, uh, a, a site called Guanchaja, which is sort of a, a nationalistic site um, that's run out of, I believe, out of Shanghai. They're saying very little about Ukraine. The news is about uh, the Olympics and how preparations are going for that, what to watch out for. And then the Olympics also this year coincide with the Chinese New Year, which is the biggest party of the year. It's sort of Christmas every day for two weeks. So they can use that as an, as an amplifier for the Olympics and for nationalistic pride and also just for you know good times. Everybody's at home eating and watching TV anyway. Uh, they can watch the Olympics. So they're writing about New Year's, they're writing about the Olympics. The little that's in there about Ukraine uh, they're focusing primarily on the United States and NATO deployments of new weapon systems and soldiers to the west of Ukraine as though that is the primary provocation. There's close to nothing in there about 100,000 Russian soldiers on the border. Uh, it is referred to uh, in Chinese papers as the Ukrainian-Russian border issue. And just yesterday, uh, for the first time, China spoke out not fully in support of Russia, uh, but with vague phrases, the sense of which were that China's, the, the, the exact phrase was China's, I'm sorry, China's, Russia's legitimate security interests should be respected without defining what those interests were and what made them legitimate. It gives them uh, some wiggle room, but they have not been critical of Russia. And it's, it's interesting in, in this regard, you know, as I said, China is interested now in global leadership. Well, is there a major country in the world with real military and economic heft that has a very good relationship with both Ukraine and Russia? Yes, there is. It's China. You know, if they were really interested in global leadership, this could be an opportunity for them to you know, be the adult, work you know, with Ukraine and Russia to try to calm things down. Uh, again, all hail Xi Jinping. Time to prove your bona fides as a global leader. That will not happen. Uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that Xi Jinping can't be seen as trying and failing in the lead up to the 20th Party Congress. And it's also, frankly, just a, a sticky wicket. I don't think they believe that they could fix it. Uh, so better to hold back. But I, I, I do think it raises some questions about China's claim to global leadership and whether it really wants leadership with the attendant risks and costs, or whether it just wants deference, uh, because they would be the obvious country to step in, you know, as we did during the Suez crisis to the UK and say, hey, you're not really an empire anymore. Why don't you back off? Uh, it won't happen, uh, which is worth noting. In total, uh, assuming whatever success is as it's defined by, by China, uh, are these Olympics a, a needle mover in the geopolitical competition among countries? Uh, I think they're a slight needle accelerant uh, in the following way. The Chinese, uh, of course, are very, very proud of their economic development, rightly so. It's never been done in human history on this scale and in this short a time. And they're particularly proud of the way that they've handled COVID, obviously after the initial uh, missteps. They're very proud that they have basically reduced it so far within China. And that is part of their claim to, it, now it's part of the legitimacy narrative of the Communist Party within China, and also part of their claim to leadership internationally. So what are the lessons of COVID for China? The lessons are that authoritarianism, isolation, and surveillance work. So they're going to be doubling down on those. That's the needle that's moving. And a successful Olympics on China's terms will move that needle just a little bit more quickly for a period of time. Uh, if, again, they see authoritarianism, surveillance, and isolation working, these are Xi Jinping's instincts anyway, and I think they'll become even more pronounced. A uh, final question, Robert, and more of a, a personal question about it. Will you follow these Olympics closely? Are you going to be glued to the to the set? And if so, do you watch as a sports fan or, or as a China analyst? So I'll be watching the opening ceremonies. I'll be watching China's coverage of the Olympics and the way that they present it uh, to the Chinese people in the world. Uh, I may watch some of the hockey. Just That would be just simply as a hockey fan, although we know that the NHL uh, players aren't going. I'll watch some of that. And then there are a couple of other uh, athletes I'll be watching. I'll, I'm interested to see what the United States makes of Eileen Gu, who is a potential uh, three gold medal winner in different freestyle, freestyle skating events. Um, she grew up in the United States, Chinese mother, American father. She uh, 
renounced her American citizenship and became a Chinese citizen at age 15, she's 18 now, to compete for Beijing in these Olympics and possibly win three golds for Beijing. She says because she wants to show uh, Chinese girls that they can enjoy skiing and be, and, and be part of all this. I will be watching to see if there's an American political reaction against Eileen Gu, sort of as a, as a meter of where the relationship stands. So far, it hasn't really reared its head. I had sort of expected some ugly uh, rhetoric from the Hill, but it, it hasn't happened. So maybe uh, she'll get a pass as a young teenager and people will just watch her ski. She's pretty good at it. Thank you. So, you know, NBC, Bob Costas, he gives us sports, but not geopolitics on the and see You give us both. You know, our, our response. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Thank enjoy you. the games. Thanks for joining us today and providing us with this preview. Glad to. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now and that you'll join us again soon for another. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.